thank you, Dennis, for the emphasis. I knew when I, when I picked this that this was a verse that most people have heard or recited or memorized or at least had something to do with. Um, when my wife and I got married, um, this chapter, you know, in a Christian wedding, a lot of times you'll set a Bible out um, and we purposefully opened it to that chapter, the love chapter, um, for this specific reason that we were celebrating love. Um, this month, uh, last week, I, I asked everybody what this month was, and I found it interesting that instead of Black History Month, somebody come up with the Love Month. Um, you know, usually they'll say Valentine's Day, um, but Love Month. I was like, oh, that's an interesting way to put that, you know, to think of the entire month dedicated to love. Um, and Valentine's Day is this month. It's a, it's a time not everybody, not every Christian celebrates Valentine's Day, and that's fine. Some people rename it so that the way they're not using the name Valentine, but they still celebrate with their sweetheart. In fact, uh, last year in Sedona, this was before I became a pastor here, we had a little uh, luau at the church on, on Saturday night. And we had a guest there that was a chaplain, and we decided in this luau we were going to renew vows for any couple that wanted to renew their vows. Now, there was a little bit of a selfish motive there because my wife and I determined at one point that we were going to get married in every state in the United States. And prior to moving here, we'd achieved all of one. And we had been here for several years, and we still hadn't been married here. And so we decided this is a great opportunity, and we, we just, we had a little luau and celebrated love. And it, it was a wonderful time. We had a good time. And in fact, Dennis brought it up um, this month, this year, we are celebrating love with not a renewal, but a, a, a wedding, a first vow uh, taking. So we're, we're excited about that. Those are, are people that are members of both Sedona and Cottonwood, but somehow they've found each other and gotten to know each other, and they're, they're going to celebrate that this month. Um, love. A lot of things going on about love right now. Um, interesting that we have so much going on about love in a world that's so filled with all the ugliness and hate that we've seen. But this is a time where we can maybe put that aside and focus on love. But what is love? I mean, seriously, what is love? Thank you. Thank you for an honest answer. Because um, when we look at it biblically, you know, the Bible says that God is love. And most Christians are satisfied with that as the definition. Well, what is love? Well, God is love. But who is God? You know, um, we look biblically through the history of humanity, through the, the scope of the Bible, and we look from the time when sin entered this earth all the way up until now, we've kind of gotten off track on understanding who God is. And if we don't know who God is, then we can't understand what love is, especially if God is love. Does that make sense? Okay. We see in the history of the Bible that, that they have gotten so far off track that by the time that Jesus came down and, and God was among the people, all around the people, they had this strange idea of what his mission was. Instead of coming down to love, they had this grand idea that, well, the Messiah is going to come and he's going to kill a whole bunch of people for us and he's going to set us up to be over everybody else and everyone else is going to have to bow down and serve us and we can't wait for that time to come. Does that sound like love? No, it got a little off track, hadn't it? I mean, even us who really don't fully understand love and, and some of us who are willing to admit that we don't understand love completely, we know that's not it. That can't be it. I'm sorry? Self-righteous love. Self love. Thank you. That, that's love for me. I mean, we're being exactly. 
that's loving that's loving me i want it my way right away you know that's that's what they expected the messiah to come down and do is to give them what they wanted right then and right there um and then jesus is talking to the disciples and even they didn't have an understanding because philip is standing there and he says just show us the father and that will suffice for us and jesus is like what have i been doing We've been here for over three years now, Philip. What have you seen me doing? How have you seen me acting? How have you seen me treating other people? And the New Testament Gospels is full of Jesus had compassion and and actions of love and things that he's doing. A selfless love instead of a self-righteous love. It's a selfless love. Putting others first. And, And the disciples didn't get it either. Yet at that same time we feel like we understand love most of the time because when we get into a relationship we have certain expectations of what we want to get out of that relationship right i mean on some level we feel like we understand love because we understand when someone is not treating us the way that we want to be treated that we feel like that's not love and if we're in a relationship such as a marriage or a family, or friends, or a church family, and we're not receiving what we expect love to be, we get a little aggravated maybe, uh, a little frustrated maybe, maybe a little disappointed, because we're not getting what we want. Almost sounds like something like what you were saying just a minute ago, Um, self-righteous. But... We often get hurt by this and we often fall into the trap of judging somebody and saying that, well, they're not loving. Yet we don't fully understand what love is anyway. And it's no wonder that we don't understand what love is because one, we've gotten off track from the original when God first created us. Um, But also, we've got people that we consider to be experts in love. And I'm just going to name a couple of them here. I don't know if anybody's heard of Dr. Egerich's. Um, Good, I've got a series for you later. Uh, (laughs) If you haven't heard of him, that's good, because I've got a series for you later. But no, he, he counsels relationships based on the biblical principle of love and respect. If you go back and look in the New Testament... They talk about love and respect. Um, Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And he he gets into this whole uh, series and and explanation of how love is that way. And, you know, he's right. I would agree with him. Love and respect, it's necessary. We have to have that in our relationships. Dr. Gary Chapman, more people have heard of him. If you haven't heard of him, you've probably heard of the five love languages. Okay, the five love languages, that's, what he, that's how he counsels relationships is there are five love languages and everybody has a strong one that they communicate love with. And you know what? He's right. I agree with him. There are five. When you look at the discipline of psychology, they have decided that there are seven types of love. And those seven types of love are based on Greek words for love. And I'm just going to read them because I can't memorize seven of them. But eros, philea, storge, agape, ludus, pragma, and philautia. Each one is a label for love. Each one is this angle, this perspective of love. You can use the word and say that it's love and translate it as love and you would be accurate, yet each one is not the full encompassing of love. Except maybe agape love. Agape love is the one that I want to look at today because that's the one that this book focuses primarily on. This Bible brings out agape love. It uses that word for for love more times than any other word. In fact, most of those words are not in here. But agape love is, and it's used repetitively. It's used often. That is the love when it says God is love. That's the love that it's talking about. When it says that God loves me, you know, we sing the song as kids, Jesus loves me. That's the love that it's talking about. That's how God relates to me. That's how God communicates love to me. But it goes a step further because we also see that Jesus says, I command you to love one another. Again, it's agape love. 
with all this emphasis on agape love in a book that I believe in, that I believe that God authored, that I believe that God has given us to learn about him from because we've forgotten so much about him, maybe we ought to look at agape love today. Amen? So take your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Um, we read out of it just a minute ago. We're going to go back to that chapter, 1 Corinthians. You, it's in your New Testament. You have your four Gospels and Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. And we're going to be in chapter 13, that chapter that has been dubbed the love chapter. And we're going to be looking at it today. But it's interesting when you read through the book of Corinthians, and I would encourage you, um, maybe this afternoon would be the best time to do it, or maybe tomorrow, since that is Valentine's Day. I would encourage you to just read through the entire book of First Corinthians. It sounds like an awful lot, but keep in mind, it was written as a letter. It was expected to be read all at the same time. So I would encourage you, take an afternoon and just go home and just read this entire letter to the Corinthians, because as you go through the letter to the Corinthians, you find out, um, we talked about this Wednesday night. When Paul writes a letter, everything is building up as it moves forward. So when you get to 1 Corinthians 13, everything that he said before is related somehow to chapter 13. So everything that he's written in here has something to do with love. And we're going to take a look at that today. In fact, as you, you read through, I'm not going to give you the full summary, but you get the impression that as he's writing to, to the Corinthian church, that something's missing. He's, he's kind of writing on a good, better, best model. In other words, you guys are doing good, but there's something better out there, and then I'm going to teach you the best. And, and so as you read through the Corinthians, you get this, this impression that that's where Paul is going with this. There's something missing in your Christian experience. There's something missing in your walk with God. And I say that because when you look at 1 Corinthians 12, the previous chapter, the last two verses, he's talking about spiritual gifts, but he says, do all, in verse 30, do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Then he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. The Corinthians, the Corinthians were experiencing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They were, they were experiencing spiritual gifts being manifested in their church. And that's why Paul is paying so much attention to spiritual gifts here, because there's a lot of spiritual gifts being manifest in the Corinthian church. But there was also getting to be a lot of competition of, well, my spiritual gift is better than your spiritual gift, or I have more spiritual gifts than what you have, or my spiritual gift qualifies me for a higher position in the church. You, know, you get the idea of what's going on here. It, it, instead of being a blessing and building up the church, it is because Become a stumbling block for this church. The spiritual gifts were not being utilized in the way that they were supposed to be used. And so Paul is addressing this here, and then he says, you know what? Honestly, desire these spiritual gifts, especially the best gifts that are out there. But let me tell you, there's a better way. There is a better way, and I'm going to teach it to you. So let's see what Paul is saying here in chapter 13, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging, clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me how much? Nothing. Paul, I don't know about you, but Paul has my attention in these first three verses. I understand there's something I need to be seeing here. And Paul is making this distinction about love that makes it superior to all the spiritual gifts that have been talked about before. There, he's showing us a more excellent or a better way. Love is a better way. He talks about the gift of tongues here, one of the spiritual gifts. And it's an amazing gift. If you've ever experienced speaking in tongues, now let me be clear, speaking in tongues. 
Speaking in tongues, there's a couple different facets to speaking in tongues. One of those, and I don't know if you've ever known anybody who can do this. My wife does this. She can be speaking in English and then turn over and speak in Tagalog, which is the Filipino language. She can also turn around and hear somebody speaking in Chinese and somebody in Chinese, and she can keep all that straight in her head. I can't keep the English language straight in my head, much less bounce around from one to the other. Speaking in tongues, generally that is a very powerful tool for sharing the gospel message. When you go over into a foreign country or an experience that I had one time bumping into somebody who does not speak English and I absolutely do not speak any other language, God can operate in a way to make you understand each other. And sometimes when it's the gift of tongues, one of you is speaking the other person's language, though you've never spoken it before. Now, there's another facet to this speaking in tongues that we often overlook because we get caught up in the, the, the glamour of speaking a different language, and I'm not downplaying that at all. I think that's a phenomenal gift. But there's also speaking in tongues, another facet here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to imagine with me some of your favorite preachers, okay? Think about those guys that you see on TV or that you hear on the radio. Those people who grab your attention when the sermon starts and they just hold on to it and you, you're, you're just enraptured by everything that they say and the wheels are turning in your head. And even after they get done preaching and they walk away, the wheels are still turning. You're still running through that message in your mind and it's still having an impact. In fact, long after... During the week, you still remember everything that's been going on in that message and you're seeing it applied in your life. That also is the gift of tongues. God has given them an eloquence to be able to speak and people hear the message of God and it comes into their lives in a different way than someone who just speaks it and you forget by the, before you even walk out the door. There's a gift there. But Paul is saying, if you don't have love... That gift is nothing. You can come in and preach a sermon, the hottest sermon that, that anybody ever heard. You can preach an evangelistic series and people are coming in, they're pouring in and you make the altar call. And, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, Jack's not here because I was going to inflate a number. So even, even he would be wowed by the number. But you know, a hundred people come up to the altar call and they're all ready to get baptized because of this series of sermons that you're doing. And praise God for that. But if there's not love, there's 110 that are walking out the back door. It's a one-way street because there's no love. You've got to have love. In fact, Paul says that if you don't have love, you sound like this big brass gong or, or a noisy cymbal. I don't know how, how many of you remember the gong show from way back when I was a kid. Man, my, that, that was the most obnoxious noise I ever heard in my life. And let me tell you, if you're sharing the word of God and you don't have love, that's how it affects people. They don't want to hear it. In fact, they want to turn and go the other way because there's no love in the message. He talks about other spiritual gifts, prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, faith. You know, these are the gifts that people really take notice of. These are the gifts that people pay attention to and, and say, wow, they've got this spiritual gift. But if you don't have love in your heart, there's really nothing spectacular about it. it. Reminds me of Solomon. If you turn with me to Second Chronicles, we're in First Corinthians. Go to Second Chronicles in the Old Testament, if you will. First uh, and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First Chronicles, then Second Chronicles, and we will be looking at chapter one. We're going to focus on Solomon for just a minute here. For, or Second Chronicles chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 7. It says, On that night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David my father be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this great people of yours? 
Then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart and you have not asked riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Wow. Wisdom. And we know that Solomon had this wisdom because when you read through the Bible, when you look through it, not only was he famous for his wisdom in Israel, but people were traveling from foreign countries to come over and just to hear the wisdom that Solomon, the, the things that would come out of his mouth. The, the Queen of Sheba, one of the most famous ones. We always look at her for other reasons. But she came just to hear this wisdom, just to see, is it true that there's somebody that wise? In fact, amongst believers, we believe that Solomon is the wisest man to have ever lived. Interestingly, not Confucius. Um, there's a difference between what Confucius say and what Solomon says. Solomon spoke in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, sang songs. Very, very wise man. But something happened. Something happened along the way to Solomon. If you turn back just a couple books to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. I'm going to read verse 4. 1 Kings 11 verse 4. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. You notice it says uh, as Solomon got old. Now remember, Solomon, not only was he the wisest and most, wealth, most wealthy, but I believe he had the most wives. Um, just look, go back and read sometime the numbers. I don't even remember the numbers. Something like 700 wives and uh, I don't know how many thousand concubines. I, I don't understand it. Uh, yeah, he did what he wanted. He ran with that. But, you know, those wives, those wives from foreign countries, um, those wives of different beliefs turned his heart against. I mean, you know, figure your whole life you're, you're arguing with them about which church you're going to go to, you know. Eventually, he, he broke down, and he started going to the other churches. He started sacrificing to other gods. He started forgetting who the Lord his God was. And, and something happened there. Um, because in verse 11, if you'll look down with me, same chapter, verse 11, it says, Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David. And for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. The wisest man, he'd been given the spiritual gifts of knowledge and wisdom. In addition to all the other blessings that God had given him, the wisest man turned his back on God. He turned his heart. Notice it says his heart. There was no love for God when he turned his heart. His heart, his love was not focused on God. And God says here, because of your father, I'm not going to completely destroy the lineage here. Because of David. In other words, what he's saying here is Solomon... You, you've changed. You've turned away. You have become nothing. Your father was a man after my own heart. I, I don't know what's happened to you, Solomon. Even with the God-given gift of wisdom and of knowledge, without love, you're nothing. It amounts to nothing. Nothing. Let's turn back with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 13. Because Paul says that love is also higher than sacrifice. 
We see people doing good deeds all the time. We see those who are always contributing to charity, who are always giving to the poor, always giving to the homeless. And those are good things. Please don't walk away from here saying that Pastor Vince said don't do that. That's not what I'm saying. But what the Bible is saying here, what Paul is writing to do that, and you don't have love in your heart, well, that's kind of like, you know, these major corporations that said, we gave $10 million to this homeless And what happens to people? Oh, we believe in that. We're going to go buy our food over here now, or we're going to go buy our clothing at this store because they're doing these good deeds. It it really makes you feel like there wasn't any love behind it except for the love for money, the love for your business. You know, we're advertising so that you will come in and, and shop at our store. That's what it feels like. Now, I'm not saying that's the way it is, but that's certainly the message that, that hits my ears when I hear that, when I hear bragging about the good things that I have done. I remember a story not too long ago, this homeless veteran, you may have heard it, this homeless veteran was found and this couple puts up this GoFundMe account for him and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for this for this homeless veteran. And it was such a beautiful, successful story, this story of love and compassion about how these people went out of their way to do this for him and got him off the street, got him in a home, got him in a car, you know, all these things. Well, a few years after that, another story came out. And it turns out that the whole thing was a setup. The homeless veteran and these couple, this couple conspired together, and it wound up a lawsuit in court because the couple took more money from the GoFundMe than the homeless veteran. And it's not even clear that he was really truly homeless. Makes you second guess when you see somebody. Are they really in need? Is this some kind of scam? It shouldn't be that way when there's love in our hearts. But you do start second-guessing, don't you? This is our human nature. Uh, verse 4 through 6, This is Paul gets a little deeper into it. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love suffers long and kind. This means that when we love, we're patient when provoked. We were just talking about this Wednesday night, patience. We, we put a lot of emphasis on that word because there are so many people that, that come along and, and provoke us, whether it's intentional or not. So many people do it. And, and when we have love in our hearts, we don't allow that to affect us. We don't allow that to control us and overtake us and and control what we say and do. When there's love in our hearts, and I mean godly love, when there's godly love in our hearts, we start learning that patience. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, if you falter in that, that that you're a bad person. That just means that, you know, we're all growing in this. We're all growing in this. We're talking on the good, better, best. The best is when you don't let it provoke you. The better is, well, it irritates you, but you don't act on it. (laughs) You know what I'm saying here. But, you know, I think when I tried to illustrate that, I I keep thinking uh, of my children. And I think of when I'm on the phone. And sometimes it's an important phone call. Daddy, 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 daddy. You know, (laughs) after a while, you're like... Son, it's the IRS. You can't do this. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean? It, it could be the doctor. It could be anybody. It could be important. But when there's love in our hearts, you know, when our kids are doing that, we don't, we don't get so upset at them and scream at them, but instead we have that patience with them. And we understand that, you know what? They're just kids. They don't have patience. I have to have patience for them. And again, it doesn't always work that way. You know, it, it doesn't. I, I wish it did. It doesn't work that way. But, you know, again, that's the, that's the ideal that we're looking for. That's the goal. Because love is others driven. Love is willing to put self aside. Love is willing to sacrifice yourself for others. Jesus said in John chapter 16 that greater love has no man than this, than he'd be willing to lay down his life for his friends. And then he took it a step further because he didn't just lay down his life for his friends, but he laid down his life for his enemies. Remember in the, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, love your enemies. 
Jesus epitomized both of those concepts of laying down and sacrificing for those you love and for those who yeah, don't love you so much. Jesus had love in his heart. The Bible says that love doesn't rejoice in sin, but rejoices in truth. That's a hard one for us. Because while we don't believe, we've, we've got this phrase coined that we love the sinner and hate the sin. That's easier said than done. And too many times we look at the sin and we, we've... Actually, we look at the sinner and we look at them and see the sin. We, we have trouble separating those two. And it becomes real easy to, to think of them in the context of that sin and apply that. And, and that makes it okay. I start dehumanizing that person. I make them less than human. And it makes it easier for me to just ignore them or to hate them or to have other feelings towards them than I should. And it's real easy in humanity to do that. But love doesn't do that. Love sees that person as a person. Love sees that person as a child of God. Love sees that person as somebody that Jesus died for. And when I see someone that Jesus loved so much that he was willing to die for, something in there should be changing in my heart that I look at them a little bit differently too. Amen? Amen. Verses 7 through 12. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but when I shall know just, or but then I shall know just as I also am known. Let me break this down just a little bit. Um, Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, though, they will fail. Now, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we love prophecy. We study prophecy. We preach prophecy. We breathe prophecy. Prophecy is, is really where we got established as, as a denomination. We like our prophecy, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But there comes a point in time when all the prophecies have been fulfilled. Everything's been fulfilled. By that time, you know, Jesus has created the new heaven and the new earth, and there's no more need to promise that. It, it becomes fulfilled. But you know, on that new heaven and that new earth, we may not need a prophecy, but we will need love. We still need that love. Prophecies reach their end. Love never does. He mentions also, well, let me find it now. Knowledge. Oh, tongues. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. You know, it's another thing that I, I believe that by the time we get on that new heaven and that new, or the new heavens and the new earth, that either we all speak the same language or at least we understand the different languages and, and we, do, we don't need to have the gift of tongues anymore because we'll know how to communicate with each other. God will have already given us that. But we still, no matter how much we can communicate with each other, we still need to communicate with love. That will last forever. That will never stop. Knowledge, guys. Now, some of you don't have to reach back that far to school, okay? Um, It wasn't that long ago. But some of us, it's been a little while, and I want to ask, how many of you, just by a straw poll here, how many of you remember everything that was ever presented in every class that you ever took? Thank God I'm not the only one. But let's, let's break this down a little bit more. How about one class that you took, not, you know, the, the entire semester, the entire year? How many of you remember everything from that class? We're still in, good, we're still in a good position. I've, I've got one hand. We'll talk later. I want to know what that class was. <laughs> Let, let's break it down a little bit further. One class period. 
How many of you remember everything that was taught in one class period? Okay, I got another hand. I, I am going to want to talk because <laughs> that's better than I can do. Okay, that's better than I can do. Most people will fall into that. You know, knowledge fades. Knowledge fades. We read it. They don't even expect you to remember everything. That's why they cram so much at you at college because if they run by the percentages, the more we give you, the more that you'll remember. I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's the way it works. Knowledge ceases, but love doesn't. We'll still need love. No matter where we are, we still need love. Paul talks about a lot of spiritual gifts here, and those spiritual gifts are given to build the church. But when the church is built, when, when the church has been taken to heaven, when, when Jesus has created the new heaven and the earth, I keep looking there because that's where the fulfillment of so many things are. We won't be building a church anymore, but we'll still need to love the church. That's the emphasis that Paul is placing here as Corinthians. You've placed so much emphasis on, on what you can do, what you can say, and you're using it to elevate yourselves. But folks, that's all going to end at some point. And the better way is to learn how to love because without love, those spiritual gifts don't mean anything. You'll notice as you read through this chapter that Paul never comes out and defines. He never gives you a definition of love. He gives you a bunch of examples, a bunch of illustrations, a bunch of ideas of love so that we can somehow relate to it. And I think he does that because he knows that not one of us really understands fully love. We, we don't comprehend it in the godly manner that, that God is trying to convey to us. Today... Because Paul's given you so many illustrations and I've thrown some in, I wanted to give you another illustration of love. And this is one that I guarantee you, you have not heard yet because my mother wrote this and gave it to me this week. Um, so you, you haven't heard it. In fact, I just heard it a few days ago. But my mother writes poems and she wrote this one. She says, open my ears, Lord, to hear the sound of songbird music greeting the morn. Open my ears, Lord, that I may hear your spirit wooing my soul forlorn. Come unto me, for I love you. Though born to listen, I've oft ignored the tender whispers of love divine. Open my ears, Lord, to recognize your sweetheart message. Won't you be mine? Give me your heart. My love is true. Again, there's no definition there. What is love? Shared. Shared, selfless, others driven, caring. So many things, so many words that we can use to describe it. And everybody seems to have a little bit different view of what that looks like and how that applies in our lives. What is love? We can't put a definition on it. And I think that's why Paul avoids putting a definition on it but instead gives you the concept, the gist, so that you can see that this is how it works. And that's how you'll know you're on the right track. Paul just outlines it. I'm not going to give you a definition today either, and that's primarily because I'm still learning it myself. I have a long ways to go. I still look at love as if I'm looking in this dingy mirror that I'm trying to get a good look at it, but I, it, it just doesn't reflect right. I can see it. I get the idea of it. And I love the idea of love, but I have a long way to claim to go before I can claim that I've got it down pat. And verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. There's three things that abide. But if you'll notice, faith and hope fits inside of love. Love encompasses those. Love is the strength behind faith. Love is what sparks hope. Therefore, the greatest of these, the greatest thing that a believer can possess is love. When we have love in our hearts, true love, godly love, our faith will stand strong. When we have this love, our hope will be in the right place, which is Jesus Christ. 
What is love? When you remove everything else, everything that you have, your, your spiritual gifts, your job, your education, your bank account, your looks, your house, if you were to strip all that away, what would be left? Do you have love? Or better yet, you know, Paul says that love is like looking in the mirror. That gets pretty personal, doesn't it? You look in the mirror and do you see love? I'll say this. I'll say this in closing. If you want to get a good picture of love, I would encourage you to take a chunk of time, an hour, two hours, an hour a day, and look at the cross. Look at Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. Stand there at the foot of the cross looking up at him. Look at the expression on his face. Look at the blood running down his head. Look at the thorns that are causing that. Look at the nails that have fastened him there. Look at the spear hanging out of his side. Look at his back at all the marks that are left there from the whips, from, from the, the, the barbs that have caught flesh and torn it away. Look at all that. And see love for you. Because if you were the only person who had ever sinned, who had ever fallen, who had ever done anything wrong, Jesus would have come down and went through every step of that for you. That, my friends, is love. And when you look at that and get a good picture of that, then I want you to look in that mirror. Is that what you see? Do you have love? How do you look in the mirror and see that? Paul lists it out here because if you were to take every time this says love or in the King James Version charity and you were to put your name if you were to look at that does it fit? That's how you look in the mirror of love. Does it fit? Because Jesus can do that. Now I'll guarantee you before you do this and get discouraged there's not a soul here that can match everything in here. And not just here, I mean in, in the world. Jesus is the only one. Paul is not trying to get you to the point where you get discouraged because you don't fit. He's trying to get you to the point to where you realize that this is a process. This is what he meant when he said, I see in part, but one day I'll see it all fully clearly. It's a growth. It's a process. It's what Christ promises to work in you until the day that he comes back because he loves you so much. Not only did he die for you, but he raised again so that you can live with him. And he promises that he will grow you. He will raise you up with him and he will change the things in your heart. He will turn you into this picture. So don't ever give up hope. Don't look at this and say, well, that's not me. I'm never going to make it. I just, yeah. Because Jesus has not given up on you. Jesus is reaching down and he's got a hold of your shoulder and he is picking you up. And it may seem like it takes a while, like a lifetime, and it does. But he will get you picked up all the way so that you can stand in the kingdom with him. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. And though this weekend is a time when we focus on love, we pray that love would be on our tongues, in our lungs, in our brain, in our hands, in our feet, every day of the year. We pray that you would work that in us because we know that you are the only way that that can happen. But we are so grateful that you never give up on us. We are so grateful that you want us to fit this picture. You want us to be able to look in a mirror and see the image of you. So that is our prayer today, Lord. We pray that you would lift us up, that you would work this work in our hearts 
and, and make us loving people. That when people look at us, they no longer see us, but they see Jesus. They see Jesus hanging on a cross. They see Jesus, the nail prints in his hands. They see the scars and they know that they are loved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, I believe we're going to have the words on the screen for hymn number 193. If they are not there, there are hymnals in your pews, and you can open up to 193. I'm going to ask Christy to play this song, and I'm just going to read the words. I want you to listen to the words. I want you to understand what they're saying as a prayer to Jesus Christ. Savior, teach me day by day. Love's sweet lesson to obey. Sweeter lesson cannot be loving him who first loved me. With a child's glad heart of love, at thy bidding may I move. Prompt to serve and follow thee, loving him who first loved me. Teach me, I am not my own. I am thine and thine alone, thine to keep, thine to rule, to save from all sin that would enslave. Love in loving finds employ in obedience all her joy. Ever knew that joy will be loving him who first loved me. Teach me thus thy steps to trace strong to follow in thy grace, learning how to love from thee, loving him who first loved me. Again, we cannot do this on our own. We need him to teach us how to love. And he promises that's exactly what he wants to do in your life. Father, again, we thank you for love. And we pray that you'll teach us that as we go our way today, that it will not be just a lesson learned and forgotten, but that it will stick with us through the rest of this week, through the rest of this year, all the way through until you come near and bring us home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. May God bless you with his love, with his grace until we meet again.